Horizons, the podcast from thegeopolity.com. My name is Adnan and I'll be your host today. Egypt for long was the political leader in the Middle East. But ever since the Arab Spring, over a decade ago, it would seem Egypt may be losing its title to a host of countries like Saudi, like the UAE or even Turkey. With a growing population which now exceeds 100 million, a government dominated by an entrenched military, increasing national debt, Egypt doesn't look anything like the regional leader it once was. So to discuss everything Egypt, I've got with me today Shadar Chowdhury, who is the newest addition to our analyst team. He's just returned from Egypt after spending about a year studying there. How are you doing, Shazad? Very well, thank you, Adnan. Thanks for having me on the show. I think for our listeners, it would be good, Shazad, if you highlighted what you were doing out in Egypt and how you found things. So I went to Egypt to study Arabic. That's something I've always wanted to do. Finally got the chance to do it. Went there with my family, my wife and my two kids. And we stayed in a part of Egypt called Medina and Nasser. It's in Cairo, the main city. It's a very well-known area in Egypt, actually, because... It's the place that students learning Arabic or any of the Islamic sciences go to. Also students who are studying in the very famous Al-Qaeda University. That's typically the place that they would stay in. Okay, good stuff. So I think probably the main question I've got for you, Shazad, is it seems a lot of infrastructure has been built in Egypt for the last few years. And for every new infrastructure project announced by the regime, there seems to be numerous challenges in Egypt's economy. So What's actually life like for Egyptians currently on the ground? What was your experience for the year you were there? Okay, life is a struggle for ordinary Egyptians. I mean, everyone will tell you that. There have been, I mean, in the time that I was there, there were numerous price hikes. In the one year, the currency devalued three times over. I think the currency has devalued about 40% since the last year or so. Commodities have really jumped up in prices. I mean, if you if you combine a devalued currency with an economy where 90% of food is imported, it means food gets really, really expensive. I mean, Egypt is the biggest import of food, of wheat from Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, I saw the price of my daily goods really, really increase. So bread, for example, when I first arrived there was 20 Egyptian pounds. And by the time I left was 25 Egyptian pounds, uh, chicken, believe it or not, is more expensive there than it is here. So a uh, life in terms of food, in terms of basic necessities, is really a struggle. I was telling you earlier that, that water, something as simple as water, you know, you don't know if it's going to be there in the afternoon, come the morning. Because uh, my first week in the apartment that I was staying with my family, the water went out three times. And when it went out, it went out for a long time, actually. It went out for like eight hours. And then the electricity, that would routinely go out. So load shedding is a common thing. And the prices for those things have gone up as well. I mean, electricity, the prices jumped up by about 300%. And I've heard that prices are still going up and going to go up even more. So life for people in Egypt, especially on the low wages that they're earning, is really a struggle. And you seem to hear that wherever you go, taxi drivers, teachers, even your doctor. So I asked my doctor, my doctor was saying he's struggling. Mm. So uh, life is weak. What's the, what's the employment situation? Like at the moment there? So people are running around just in search of any work that they can find. Soldiers, they earn around 325 Egyptian pounds a month, which is the equivalent of 15 UK pounds. Teachers earn around 700 Egyptian pounds, which is the equivalent of around 30 UK pounds. So if you think about chicken being more expensive there than it is here, and then put those numbers in context, it's 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 impossible. People mm-hmm. just can't live. Um I've been served at juice bars by 12-year-old kids. Wow. I've seen, I mean, my wife was telling me that when she go when she went to our local fruit market and you know, the boy who's there, is, he's the same boy in the morning as, as the guy in the evening. I mean, he's, he's always there. He's always there. We asked him, I mean, if you come in the morning, you're here. If you come in the evening, you're here. I mean, you're standing in the same spot day after day, hour after, hour after, after. I mean, when do you get a chance to rest? And he said, I don't. He's 19 years old. He's there seven days a week morning till night and he earns around i think it's less than a pound a day so life is a struggle for people over there there's zero prospects for employment for the youth most young guys i spoke to they're looking for ways to have the country all together there's no future even your most educated people are, are, are struggling to find work i've had accountants drive me around as taxi drivers one of my taxi drivers actually used to work in the u.s he used to work for the kennedy space center Wow. So he was an aeronautical engineer. He had to come back to look after his parents. But really, really educated guys. 
are struggling to find decent work in, in Egypt. Uh, and when they do find any kind of work, their response is usually, thanks to God, that I've got something. But most people are just struggling to find work. And, mm. and then there, there is no prospects. Mm. So I suppose my next question is, how did it get so bad? So what is the regime or what's the CC strategy with the economy? How, how, how has it been managing the economy? So CC has been taking out of loans from the IMF. And he's been putting them mainly into vanity projects. You probably heard about New Cairo. It's it's a whole city built uh, next to the next to the old Cairo. And Cis has been throwing whatever money he's been getting from the IMF into that. And he's really really committed as well. Watching one interview with him, and the journalist is asking him about New Cairo, and he's saying to her, "If we starve, we starve, and if we don't eat, we don't eat, but we will build." Uh, New Cairo. Just explain where that is and. Okay, so you have... Is it like a gated community? That's what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, so, so it's basically a haven for the super rich. Mm-hmm. Uh, security people, military police, people close to the president. It's a place for them to, to live in. It's basically mansions, gated communities, villas. It's really, really nice. Uh, biggest... Did you manage to get in there yourself? So I managed to get in there. I, I, I actually went there to see, a, to see a mosque. It's the biggest mosque in, in Africa, named after wow. city called al Fatah Mosque. <laughs> and it was really, really hard to get there, actually, because most Egyptian taxi drivers can't go. There's about three checkpoints on the way in. I was lucky enough to get in. And quite funnily, the, the driver who let me in, he happened to live in the area, which is why he could get there. He asked me, um, or he told me rather that, yeah, don't worry, I'll look after you. I'll make sure you get inside. And I showed him my red passport. I go, don't worry, mate, I'll look after you. Because the way things work in uh, Egypt is uh, if you've got a European passport, an American passport, you're treated a lot better than the, the guys who live there. But yeah, uh, a lot of money has been taken from the IMF, thrown into vanity projects. And unfortunately, a lot of that money, before we even get to the project, it's kind of, it, it fills the pockets of some official somewhere. Mm. I remember even hearing, I think CC said, uh, we have no plan, we have no deadline. We just build, we just build. So he's really committed to building. He's built a new express lane next to the Suez as well. There's bridges. So there's, there's roads so, going so up this everywhere. Suez Canal expansion yeah. project they've got, will that have any impact on the, the broader economy? This is quite funny, actually. CC was advised before he built the new Suez Canal that this will bring zero economic benefit to the country. And he said in response that we don't listen to the specialists, to the experts, we build for the morality of the people. So this is where he's coming from. So in his view, building, that's the way to get the economy, to get the country out of its desperate situation. But it's not worked because bridges and roads don't feed stomachs. Okay, so how does your average Egyptian get by then with this strategy being led by the regime? People don't eat chicken. People don't eat meat. A lot of the population have access to these subsidized food cards mm. if you have one of these cards you can get bread you can get basic like a voucher like a voucher kind of you can get basic bread beans at, at subsidized prices the problems which which has always been a good thing and it's uh, kind of the only good thing that egyptians had in their lives these was just some of the crumbs that the government had to offer the people and it was good to get some kind of popular support but as of last month i think eight of those food categories have now been excluded So there's even fewer staple foods to choose from. But people usually wouldn't eat chicken meat. They would eat bread, water, uh, beans. Some of them can't even afford that. And so there have been stories of people starving in their homes, being proud, too proud to to go out and beg for money. It's well known that Egypt has about one million people living in graveyards and cemeteries, and that number has increased. Some people are saying it's three million now. So has this all had a knock-on effect on crime, on violence? Theft. Not from what I heard or saw or read or anything like that. People would rather, like I said, sit sit in their homes and starve. They kind of put up with it um, to a point. To mm-hmm. a point. So, uh, for example, I was there for Eid, and typically parents buy their kids Eid clothes. They didn't this time. They just bought food. So, th- th- I th- I was reading Shalad at the time that there was a, a ban on. Eid gatherings, yeah. on Tarabi prayer. What was going on there? In terms of Ramadan, I was there for Ramadan. And a lot of restrictions were imposed on the Tarawi prayers, the evening prayers, the Tahajjid prayers. So what happened is the Tarawi prayers were limited to 30 minutes. You couldn't pray wow. more than that. The Tahajjid prayers are burned all together. Itikaf, which is a seclusion in the mosque, was burned mm. all together. And Iftar was burned all together from happening inside the masjid. So... The excuse for all of this was corona. Social distancing was enforced in the mosques as well. You had to social mm-hmm. distance. And this was all happening at a time where all those restrictions were lifted in every other country, including Saudi Arabia. So you could do the Umrah, but you couldn't do this in, in Egypt. Most of the population had been vaccinated because it's mandatory in, in Egypt anyway. 
Mm. But for some reason, congregations weren't allowed in the mosques. And this, for a lot of Egyptians, was, was a red line. Even the Wazir al-Awqaf, which is the Ministry of Religious Affairs, they came out on TV and said, look, if you find anyone in the mosques, we're going to arrest you. And it was live. they broadcast live, them knocking on mosque doors, checking if anyone's inside and wow. threatening to arrest them. So this was really a red line for the people. And by the end of Ramadan, the last three days, Sisi had to lift all of these restrictions. But like I said, he had no problem with people gathering together for a football match between Senegal and Egypt. Mm. But when it came to the mosques, so a lot of people interpreted this as CC is an enemy of Islam Muslims. He's scared, doesn't want any conversations to take place. So this leads nice to my next question, Shazad. Um, how, how do you see CC's grip? Now it's been, I've uh, been 2013 is when he did his coup. So next year it'll be a decade. Mm. So he's been in power for a decade. So how is he managing to still remain in power despite the state of the economy? What sort of tactics did you see on the ground? How has he still managed to remain in power despite where the economy is and these challenges that you've outlined and the people are facing? I think the biggest thing is fear. The number of stories I heard about people getting abducted, disappearing from the streets or their homes, trials where no lawyers were present and no access to any kind of family or legal representation, I lost count. There are mass trials without evidence. There are executions that happen. Interesting story. Um, you, you, I don't know if you remember the Rabah killings. Uh, in, in the protests in the Arab Spring in 2011, loads of protesters gathered in a place called Rabah, and Sisi led a mass killing spree, and he killed between 900 and 1,000 protesters and civilians. He accused them all of being Ikhwan, and more recently, he's more like blamed them for the entire incident. I think 1,200 civilians were prosecuted, rather, for the death of nine officers at that time, but no officers have been prosecuted for the death of 900 civilians. Oh. So there is really a state of fear. People are scared that if you speak up, something might happen to you. But even the people are speaking out. There was a, uh, there's a media show. It's a new series called The Choice, al Ikhtiar. It's a show about the rise of Sisi. It's, it's an endless source of memes, memes let's put it that way, because oh. in the show, Sisi is brave, he's courageous, he's a hero. He's pious. And he's tall. <laughs> so there was a lawyer who publicly criticised, I think his height. Yeah. Um, his name was Nabil Abishayh. And for that alone, just for criticising him in that way, he was sentenced to 15 years for spreading false news. But this is really what the government does. It, it keeps people in line in check by using fear. And even if they mock the show, something like that, something as simple as that might get you in some serious trouble. The, the, the other thing that he does is, or he's done more recently, he's invited the dialogue with the opposition. So a few days ago, Sisi announced that he'd be releasing about 5,000 Ikhwan opposition from prisons because they, they now fill the prisons. He's going to release about 5,000 of them and he's going to start a dialogue uh, with them to get out of the, the whole economic situation as if, as if to say that uh, blood is somehow on their hands as well. But yeah, some desperate moves by, by Sisi. And uh, Ikhwan, I don't know, did you meet yeah. any of them on the ground? What's their situation you, like currently? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, so their situation is not good at the moment. CC has built loads of prisons since he's come to power. Actually, a third of prisons are built by him in the last 10 years. And they're mainly filled with, with activists and political opposition, mainly Ikhwan. Some say it's up to 100,000 Ikhwan in prison behind oh. bars. So they've mainly gone quiet, but there are some people on the ground still, yeah. So you, you wouldn't say they've gone underground? Let's put it this way, they're a lot quieter than they used to be, mm. you don't see them as much. Reading around just yesterday, obviously the regime's got a narrative to try and explain why things are so bad. They've been putting the blame on COVID-19 and now the war in Ukraine. So how much of Egypt's current problems can be put down to these two? So the, the regime keep changing their mind about what the problems happen in the first place. If you ask the people why, why the problem's happening, they'll say CC. And if you ask the regime why the problem's happening, they'll say it's the people. <laughs> Here are too many of them, population is growing too fast. And when they can't use that excuse anymore, they'll say Corona. And when they can't say that, they'll say Ukraine. And then when they can't say that, they'll go back to the population again. So it kind of just goes around in a circle. Uh, but the economic situation even before COVID and even before Ukraine was pretty bad. You might remember just before COVID kicked off, uprisings were starting in Egypt. They had started in some other countries already. So Corona kind of came in and saved the day for Sisi. But the situation was very bad to begin with. National debt before seats took power was about 36 million and now it's 400 million he didn't just take 
in the last one or two years. Yeah. He's been taking the the whole time. That debt's been building. And the IMF money he's been taking, that's, that's not having any impact on people's lives. Well, the two things. One, it hardly, it, it doesn't reach, most of the money that comes in is, well, the officials lay loot it. Oh, okay. Basically. Uh, and then the country's left to pay it off. And then what does, what does get through goes towards these vanity building projects. The situation is that half of the tax money that Egypt makes goes towards paying back the interest on these loans. Uh, so it's a pretty bad situation. So these, these are these IMF loans are not helping at all. Mm. I mean, they, I mean, one of them came with the condition that Egypt can't use its fields to grow wheat. It has to, it has to make cotton, which is a disaster for Egypt because it needs wheat and it doesn't need the cotton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shadad, how do you see things playing out? When you were there, could you see Arab Spring 2.0 anywhere in the horizon? It's, it's a black cloud over Egypt. I don't think it's a question of if, it's a question of when. When I was there, my teacher said to me, he was buying some coffee. When he heard the price, uh, he just started swearing at Sisi. And the guy sitting in the coffee started swearing off as well. So the situation is that it's, reach, it's reaching a boiling point. People can't hold it anymore. Another one my teacher said, uh, enough talk, now we need to go to the streets. Mm. And this is the feeling that people are really boiling. And I think they're saying that the prices are going to rise again this month by 15%. How much can people take? People are really fed up. You're not going to find one voice in the country who supports CC. Uh, for Shadad, a decade ago, the people came out on the streets yeah. and the army removed an 80-year-old man, Hosni Mubarak. They removed him, but they maintained power. Uh, do you think 10 years on, people have realised that the same institution is still in power? Do you think this time round, they'll go toward the whole system change? Or how do you see things playing out? Honestly, I do feel that people still think that if we change the guy, things will get somehow incrementally bigger. There's still a bit of a way to go in terms of seeing the system as a problem. Mm. Yeah. I suppose in a country where... You, you work on a daily wage this is the thing. and you're trying to make ends meet. Having a, a look at the system, people. thinking about the system is yeah. just not the first thing on your yeah, mind. A lot of people haven't got time to think. They're so focused on where the next meal is coming mm. from. I mean, even guys who are middle class, you could say, they're getting squeezed so bad that they're just thinking about, okay, work, 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 work. But you can't, you can't ignore the, the situation that's happening. You're living the problem day to day. Prices are going up. Security situations getting tired. People don't, they're not blind to what's going on. Mm. It's just, have you got, have you got the time to, to do anything about it? I think the other thing is that people have lost, and this is really sad to say, but I did notice that there was a lot of hope, mm-hmm. um, especially from people who were involved in the last uprising. They do feel that the hope is lost, but it just takes one guy to come in and say, you know what, you know what, this guy, he needs to go. One guy, it just takes one guy to speak up. I'll give you an example. My wife was speaking to her teacher. And I think the first time my wife... They were talking about prices. Prices were going up. And the first time my wife said, oh, this is easy, man. It's such a problem. Um, it gave my wife's teacher a heart attack. <laughs> her jaw dropped. But the second time my wife mentioned it, a couple of days later, like, she was chiming in. She said, yeah, he has to go. We need to get rid of this guy. So it just takes one guy to be vocal. Then everyone kind of starts speaking as well. Yeah. I suppose what you just outlined, Egypt, a lot of these countries, the Middle East, they are very really security states. So where we take for granted, we're having this conversation sitting in London. If we're in Egypt having this conversation, your life's on the line. I mean, you were mentioning just criticising the regime, you could get 15 years in prison, which shows you how these type of regimes maintain power. It's really through fear. It's through the um, uh, iron uh, grip. My last question, Shazad, is there's something I've been trying to make sense of. If I was CC and I saw my predecessor was overthrown yeah. because the economic situation was so bad, the one thing I would do is make sure I improve the lives of people to some degree so I don't get overthrown. What's going through his head? It, it seems the situation far worse now than it was under Mubarak. Yeah. And we saw what happened to Mubarak in the end. What's going through his mind? I mean, does he, is he so far away from the people he can't see these or... Is he just deluded? Because we've seen whether recent history or even European history I like going back to, if the people are over here and their leaders are somewhere else, eventually the leaders get overthrown. So what's he thinking? What's going, he's doing everything you do to get yourself overthrown. It's, it's, it's almost like he's, he's the worst leader they've ever had. You know Jamal Abdel Nasser? Mm. At least the guy has silver tongue on him, right? This guy's like, we will build and we've got no plan, <laughs> we've got no vision and we've got no budget and we'll just build. You know, the last time Egyptians had a say in, mm. 
if you enroll them, they vote for Ikhwan, yeah. the Islamic option. I think where he's coming from is the only way that he can stay in power is by having an iron grip. Uh, the moment he gives people room to breathe, room to think, uh, room to vote, or room to elect their leaders, or have a choice. They or keep, go to the mosque and pray. Yeah, they keep choosing the Islamic option. People there are very Islamic. They still talk about Salahuddin and the greats of Islamic history, Ahmed bin al-As. That, that rich tradition is still well, well alive in their brain, in their minds. They have this view that they have responsibilities to carry their religion to the world. That feeling of we are a great nation and we achieve so much and we have this amazing military pedigree and we can achieve so much. Uh, This thought is very much alive in their heads. So they're very connected to their Islamic roots. And um, I think if you gave these people a choice in who would rule them, they wouldn't choose Sisi. So Shazam, my final question, this really is my final question. (laughs) the economic trouble and a lot of what you outlined, how much has it seeped through to the wider army? Has, is the wider army being taken care of or do they face the same problem as the people of Egypt are? So conscription is mandatory in Egypt. Mm. You've got to do one to three years. If you're doing that, life is miserable in the army. It's, it's like you might as well be in prison. It's torture. My son's kickboxing teacher, when he was doing his conscription, uh, his months, months would go and they wouldn't let him shower, have wow. a change of clothes. As soon as the battery in his phone died out, there was no way to charge it. So he'd be, he'd have no way of, connect, of contacting his family. And there are loads of horror stories like this for people in the Egyptian army. You just, it, your, your, your time and service are the worst years of your life. So those people aren't well looked after. But there are some guys who are well looked after. Top brass are looked after very well. I mean, New Cairo is for these guys. Mm-hmm. New Cairo is for them, police, security, ministry, big businessmen. The whole idea is you have a gated community away from the rest of the population and they're well looked after. So the guys, that, you know, the military and police, they're not really feeling it. They had their own mosques. They had their own shopping centres, places to eat. They have everything. Their own initial places, sports areas. And they have their own kind of internal economy as well. They are, they are half the Egyptian economy. So in terms of being shielded from the problems, yeah, they enlarge you. So I suppose, Shazad, in summary, we've come full circle to the eve of the Arab Spring again. Yeah. It seems like we've got the same circumstances again. There seems to be a big uh, gap between the ruler or the rulers uh, and the people. And as you mentioned, uh, it's a matter of when now yeah. rather than if. So, yeah, it's something to watch. Uh, we'll be keep an eye on Egypt going forward. It is the uh, heartbeat of the Middle East. It is. What's the saying they said? Uh, when Egypt sneezes, the, the region catches the cold. But well, thanks for the time, Shazar, today. It's a really, really good insight. Thanks very much, Andrew. If you want to learn more about Egypt and the Middle East, please check out our website, www.thegeopolity.com, all one word. You can also learn more on other regions and issues by accessing our website, where you will find comprehensive insights. I'm Adnan, and thanks for listening.